Would you pray with me this morning? God, help us to recognize the very things that we have sung about today, the truth of those things, your love for us, your goodness towards us, your sovereign power over us, your control in this world that surrounds us. Father, may we believe those things with our whole hearts. May those things inspire confidence in you, trust in you. When we can't see, when we can't understand, when we can't piece together the why or the what, may we trust you. And Father, today as we listen to your word, I pray that there would be a, an interaction, an engagement of your, your spirit speaking to our hearts and to our minds. Father, so that we could hear and understand and so that we'd be empowered to do what your word says, not just think about it, not even stop at the point of believing, but demonstrating our faith by our doing. And Father, if there's someone listening, someone hearing, that even now you're working in their lives, you're drawing them, you're convincing them, you're changing the way they think and the way they feel, Father, I pray that you would draw them all the way to yourself today and that in faith believing they would become your son or your daughter, part of your everlasting family, part of your kingdom, and would know you and enjoy you forever. So Lord, speak, enable us to hear, cause us to do, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 14 is our text today. My son Daniel was asking me yesterday what I was preaching on today and asked me if I was going to try to go through another whole chapter in one message again. I said, yes, I am. I've got a lot to say here. There's a lot to hear. And I hope you'll take some notes. And I pray that part of this, all of this, some of this specifically, all of this collectively in one way or another will speak to you. But I want to speak to a subject that I think hits us right where we are, right in our wheelhouse today. Right where you and I live and work, the sort of community that we live in, the sort of culture that we're trying to engage for the sake of Christ. We're trying to be faithfully, as 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, ambassadors of Christ. Our role and responsibility in the world is to plead with people, to be reconciled to God. And so we've got to live in a certain way to do that, to have any validity to what we say. We've got to have something to say that draws them to Christ. And we've got to be firm. And we've got to be strong. We have something that is true. It's propositional truth. It's not just true for me. It's not just true sometimes. It's eternally true. It's true whether or not someone believes it, embraces it, accepts it. Regardless of their response to it, we hold something to be absolute truth. And that truth is in a person named Jesus, in the message that Jesus gave that we call the gospel, the good news. The challenge to the truth, of course, is this. We live in an age of denial. Denial of truth at all is a concept that anyone can even know truth. Denial in truth is an objective reality. Truth more based on feelings and experiences than concrete facts that are unchangeable, irreversible, incontrovertible. So how do we address the culture in which we live faithfully when it denies the very thing that we hold most important and most dear? I pray some of Acts chapter 14 and what I share with you will speak to that in a way that you can live out this week, this month, this year, and beyond. Look at verse 1. Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue, and they spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the believers, against the brothers. So they remained a long time speaking boldly for the Lord and bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and they fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Laconia and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. I'll make a couple of points from that introductory passage of the text. You can see in the map, you can see where the gospel now, through the faithfulness of the apostles, and also through the pressure of persecution, is spreading. And look what's happening here. Something's happening in their times that you and I are going to see in ours as well. 
And it's the reality that truth is always going to be controversial and even divisive. That's what truth does. Truth draws a hard line. Truth said this is not gray, this is black or white. There are things that are false and things that are absolute. And that by itself, whatever the subject is, is always going to be controversial and divisive. And when it comes to spiritual truth, when it comes to propositional statements about who God is and what God does, you can expect, because it's always been this way, not just from our own limited experience, our own small purview of what's happening in our world, but throughout history, that truth like this likely will incite opposition and even persecution. And that's exactly what was happening. Not everyone is going to receive the good news as good news. They're just not. For some people, that's going to be an affront to them, an offense to them. For some people, that's going to be preposterous to them, foolishness to them. But the Bible said exactly that that would be the case. So how do we respond when we know we have something to say, we believe in something so strongly, we're so convinced that it is not just our answer, not just our hope, but it is the answer and the hope for all mankind what do you do with that when it's opposed, when it's refused, when people are antagonistic towards it? How should we respond? Let me give you a few thoughts just from this text, an example that Paul and Barnabas set and the other spiritual leaders, religious leaders of the day. First one is this, when it's opposed, when the truth is opposed, when Christ is opposed, remain in the fight. Remain in the fight. This is what the enemy is about. This is his strategy, I'm convinced. Whatever pressures he can exert on you or me or us collectively that will cause us to back down, that will cause us to be quiet, that will cause us to stop telling the truth, speaking the truth, standing for the truth, whatever will work is what he will do. That's the strategy. In fact, one of the grand effects of that strategy, the silencing of the church, has been seen in our day. If we can take our faith, or if the enemy can take our faith, which is very public, and instead make it private, if you and I can, can be, be convinced that that's normal and natural, that we shouldn't expect to share this openly or publicly or be able to believe it where we work and where we live, if we just have to keep that to ourselves, the enemy's already won. This is not a private, personal faith alone. This is a kingdom story. There's the kingdom of darkness, and there's the kingdom of God in Christ, and God is inviting us out of that old kingdom into the new kingdom, the kingdom that will be fully consummated when King Jesus reappears. That's not private or personal. Everyone is going to be on one side or the other of that line. And so stay in the fight. Number two, retreat only when absolutely necessary. In this passage, they found out that they were about to be stoned. They found out that they're so antagonistic towards them that they're going to they're going to kill them if possible they're going to pick up stones against them they found out the, the response of the people and so they retreated only then but even as they retreated it wasn't a permanent retreat they re-engaged somewhere else if you're in a conversation with someone who's antagonistic towards the gospel they don't want to talk about it, they don't want to hear it or you work in a place that will not allow you to publicly express your faith if you have to retreat for a moment it doesn't mean you retreat permanently. You look for other opportunities and other open doors. We're not waving a white flag of surrender. We're looking for where is God at work? Where is God moving? Who is God speaking to already? And where can I re-engage? We saw this in the last chapter, chapter 13. Verse 50, when the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city to stir up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, they drove them out of their district, but they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. When the message is not being received by person or group, what do you do? Do you just quit? People don't want to hear this anymore. People aren't interested in this anymore. This is the times in which we live. We might as well just retreat back to our church or to our small group or just practice at home with our family. No, that's not what we do. We'll retreat if necessary, but we're going to re-engage elsewhere. Number three, because the battlefront the battle in which we are currently engaged is primarily a battle over ideas. What is true? What is false? What is right? What is wrong? And because we believe the truth, and we know what Jesus said about it, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Only the truth can do that. Because the battleground is a battleground over right and wrong, battle of ideas, a battle over true or false, you and I have to, and I borrow this statement from 
the Russian dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you and I have to refuse to live by lies. Refuse to live by lies. You and I live in a time now where things that are apparent, obvious, self-validating, are now being denied as being true. And the great strategy we see being employed against us is to deny things that are clearly true, as if they're not. I saw a story this week, just to prove the point. I saw an article, maybe some of you saw it, it was on a lot of news outlets. A transgender inmate at a so-called all-women's prison impregnated two other inmates. And you think through that, and you can explain that to the person around you if you need to later. As a result, they transferred that inmate to a male prison, but then in the article it said, or to a different prison, but then in the article it referred to her frequently, her, all the other inmates. Someone on this board reporting these things showed a picture of this inmate, looked anything but female, but those are lies. Females don't impregnate other females. To put a man into a female prison and then call her a female and say she impregnated females is not the truth. And when you and I live by the lies of our culture and society, we're empowering it. But you and I stand for absolute truth. You and I stand for things that are absolutely so. Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote an essay by that title, Live Not By Lies. He published this essay on the day of his arrest and the day before his exile from the Soviet Union. And let me read you a portion of what he wrote. Now, again, the context is different. He's talking about living under an authoritarian, oppressive regime that controls all flows of information, all definitions and thoughts. He's talking about the, the Soviet Union of the mid-70s. Listen to what he said. We are approaching the brink. Already a universal spiritual demise is upon us. A physical one is about to flare up and engulf us and our children while we continue to smile sheepishly and babble but what can we do to stop it? We haven't the strength. But it will never come unstuck by itself. If we all every day continue to acknowledge, glorify, and strengthen it, if we do not at the least recoil from its most vulnerable point, from lies, he said, from lies. When violence bursts onto the peaceful human condition, its face is flushed with self-assurance. It displays on its banner and proclaims, I am violence, make way, step aside, I will crush you. But violence ages swiftly. A few years pass, and it's no longer sure of itself. To prop itself up, to appear decent, it will, without fail, call forth its ally. Lies. For violence has nothing to cover itself with but lies, and lies can only persist through violence. And it's not every day and not on every shoulder that violence brings down its heavy hand. Listen to his statement. It demands of us only a submission to lies, a daily participation in deceit. And this suffices as our fealty or surrender. And therein we find the most accessible key to our liberation. Listen to this statement. A personal non-participation in lies. Even if all is covered by lies, even if all is under their rule, let us resist in the smallest way. Let their rule not hold through me. In the culture in which you live that denies truth, that embraces so much that is preposterous in this world, let it not hold true through you. In a more recent book, Rod Dreher, borrowing from the themes of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, in his book, Live Not By Lies, explains. He says, what did it mean to live by lies? It means, it meant accepting without protest all the falsehoods and propaganda that the state compelled its citizens to affirm, or at least not to oppose, to get along peaceably. Everybody says they have no choice but to conform, says Solzhenitsyn, and to accept powerlessness. But that is the lie that gives all the other lies their malign force. The ordinary man may not be able to overturn the kingdom of lies, but at least he can say that he is not going to be its loyal subject. We see in this culture, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas enter into a city governed by lies. They worship false gods, a pantheon of false gods. The culture says, this is true, this is right. But how will you get the gospel of truth into a culture that believes the opposite? Not by living by those lies, not by validating them or verifying them, but by boldly saying, but this, this is the truth. And finally, number four, remember this. 
as I was thinking through this text this week and revisiting, I added this thought. You know, there, there's an underlying foundational conviction that the Apostle Paul held. And I won't say that it was the source of all the strength, because that was the Spirit of God. But at least mentally, emotionally, psychologically, he held to this, which gave him confidence, which gave him boldness, which gave him endurance in the face of opposition always. He remembered this, and these words that lead off the grand theological treatise that we know as the letter to the Romans. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul said this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, or to the Gentile, or to the pagan. I'm not ashamed of this. I, I'm not going to hold this captive to my own private opinions about it, to my own personal expressions of it. I'm going to unleash this gospel because I know this to be true. This gospel has the power to save anyone who will believe it. Whether they come from a religious background, whether there's some religious furniture in the room, maybe a pre-existing belief in God of some sort, a pre-existing comprehension of right and wrong and laws and consequences, or whether they're pagan completely and worship false gods like Zeus and his messenger Hermes, as we see in this text, it doesn't matter. I'm going to give the good news boldly because it saves. And the important point to remember in all of this, as we think about these persecutions that he faced, it's not the temporal cost to Paul. That's never what he had in mind. This is going to be hard for me. This is going to be painful for me. People are not going to like me. This may be costly for me. It's not that temporal cost. It's always the eternal reward for those who believe. God is doing something here. God is working something here. And God, by his grace, has allowed Paul and Barnabas to be a part of it. John Mark, we know, has already departed it. That would be a point of serious contention between Paul and Barnabas down the road. We don't know all the details in the text that we looked at last week, but perhaps the heat got turned up too high, the cost became too great, the persecution too much. Maybe he wasn't mature enough. Maybe he wasn't ready enough. But he shirked in that moment. But they did not because they counted the cost and considered the reward. And the reward was worth, worth it. The cost, short-lived, temporary. The reward, eternal for all who believe. Look at verse 8. Now at Lystra there was a man, or Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him, and seeing they had faith to be made well, and we don't know how, Scripture doesn't elaborate on that. That's a Holy Spirit action there. It's the Holy Spirit working internally and Paul revealing something to him in that moment. He said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and he began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, don't miss this cultural moment, they lifted up their voices saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas, they called Zeus. And Paul, Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices to the crowd. But when the apostle Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments, as any religious Jew would, knowing that the greatest of all offenses is to blaspheme the true almighty God, to stand in his place and be worshipped. And instead, what could be worse? They tear their garments, rush out into the crowd, saying, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of, na of like nature with you, and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Did you catch that moment? They're about to offer sacrifice, worshiping them as gods in human form. And they tell them, turn from these vain things, these worthless things, to the one true God. In past generations, this God allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. These things that you think indicate Zeus reveal God. These evidences that you attribute to your false gods come from the one true God. He has left a witness before you. But even with these words... They scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. Here's a statement from that text. 
Only the one true God can provide what this culture and its people most desperately need. Paul knew that. These were not irreligious people. These were not people without gods. You know, a lot of places where the missionary effort goes today are places that are full of gods. We had a visit with one of our supported missionaries, C.V. Vadavana, this week, who spent a few days with us in Dothan, and Lord willing, some will be going to India in the new year to do work there, teaching, training, serving. It is not a, a nation devoid of gods. In fact, it's quite the opposite. They have a myriad of gods in India. Unfortunately, the nation that will soon, probably in this decade, become the most populous nation on earth has entire regions, vast areas, untold population that's never heard the name of the one true God and Jesus that he sent. They don't know him. And in that culture, you don't embrace the other gods. You don't celebrate Vishnu and also offer Jesus. You say, these are vain things. These are worthless things. Turn from these worthless things and embrace the one true God who has not left himself without witness among you. And that's hard. And people don't receive that very well. When you tear down the gods of a culture or a society, you're in for a fight. And this is exactly what's happening here. He says, listen, only this one true God can provide for you what you, what you seek. That there's one God, and the ones that you have are not it. So don't withhold that from him. That's the message. People are not without things that they value, that they hold dear. But they're not ultimately satisfying. They don't answer the deepest questions of life. And they sure don't give them eternal security. So don't withhold the one thing that will. See, as Paul goes into this culture, it's not that he wants to prove them wrong. He, he's not simply trying to de debate with them and so defeat them in the arena of ideas. He's got life to give them. And he knows they don't have it. He knows those things are empty and vain and worthless. So this is what I share with you, this truth. And so God... As we saw during the ministry of Jesus, we saw during the early ministry of Acts, again, by his own sovereign will and grace, enables the miraculous to take place. A miraculous event that doesn't give anyone eternal life, but sets a stage for a conversation to be had, a message to be given. Gathers the attention of the crowds, and now all of a sudden people are looking and everyone is there. They think this is Zeus and Hermes. In his great book on, on the life and ministry of Paul, John Pollock, the book called The Apostle. There's a little paragraph about this encounter. It says, In Lystra's legendary past, as every child learned at his or her mother's knee, the supreme god Zeus and his messenger and herald Hermes had disguised themselves as poor travelers and sought shelter among Lyconians rich and poor. They were repeatedly turned away until they knocked at the door of an old peasant couple, Philemon and Balchus, who sheltered and fed them. The gods then disclosed themselves, turned the inhospitable ones into frogs, and the cottage of Balchus into a, a gold and marble temple that has stood out, outside Lystra since long before the Romans. Lyconians always look to the day when the two gods should return, and this time would treat them with honor. So there's a historical context. So now Barnabas, presumably being quiet, standing there in some regal look, apparently, Paul speaking, and they think they're gods. Paul says, turn from these vain things to a living God. Turn from these false idols. And imagine as he says that, this is the prevailing belief of the entire populace. He's saying that right there in the shadow of a, of a vast temple to Zeus. Turn from this. This is worthless. Turn to a living God. I'll give you a quick thought before we move on. And there's so much more to, to delve into here. But for time's sake, we'll go quickly. I'll give you a quick thought on sharing the gospel, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting. Don't start the gospel story, the good news, with man. Don't start talking about people and what they lack, their, their lack of happiness or satisfaction or you know, direction or purpose or value, all those places we start to try to satisfy rather basic needs. Because you're going to encounter people who are pretty self-satisfied. You're going to encounter people who are pretty happy. You encounter people that don't really think long-term or don't play the long game, uh, may not even appeal. You don't start there. And I'd also encourage you, don't start with sin. 
Too often we start our gospel conversations, maybe sort of like the guy on the street corner holding up a sign of God's judgment. We start with sin, and before we even get a chance to give the good news, we're already written off. Judgmental. Hateful. Unloving. Where do you start the gospel story? You start the gospel story in the same place where the scriptures do. Where every gospel preacher did in the Bible, you start with God. Who is God? Who is God? What did God make? What did God intend? What did God design? What did God want from you? God who made you in his image. God who created you to be part of his plan, to rule over this earth, to subjugate it and take care of it. God who made you for fellowship and interaction with him. God who made you something unlike what we have become. God, let's start with God because that's where the story's going to end up. As we stand before God, start with him. And that's exactly what Paul did. Let me tell you about the God who made everything. Because see, that's a lot bigger than your sense of purpose or value, your sense of pleasure or satisfaction with life. And it's even more important because without an understanding of God, sin doesn't even hold much weight or value. We start with God, the ultimate, the almighty, the holy, the just, the judge, the king, the one to whom we'll all give an account, then all the good news flows from that. Look at verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. So keep the scene. They thought they were gods. They denounced that completely, as emphatically as they could. Even that didn't keep people wanting to offer sacrifice to them. But then the Jews show up again. So the religious Jews who've rejected the Messiah come from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds... They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. A couple of thoughts there. We don't have time to elaborate, but man, isn't it something how fickle the public can be? How quickly the tide can turn. I think of Jesus speaking to the crowds. The Bible says when Jesus spoke to the crowds, he never entrusted himself to them because he knew what was in their hearts. So in one moment, they're saying, these are gods, let's worship them. The next moment, hey, maybe you're right. Let's kill them. Let's stone them. And so they stoned Paul. This is not a formal execution as we see in some settings of stonings in the Bible. This looks to be spontaneous. This is someone now getting stirred up in the crowd, being riled up. And in that mob scene, the first person picks up a rock and heaves it. And then rock after rock is thrown, crashing upon them, face and head, neck and back, until Paul lays there in a crumpled heap. Perhaps Barnabas has slid off to the side. Perhaps they paid no attention to Barnabas. He was saying nothing. We don't know. But Paul there lays in a crumpled heap. And so now they drag him out, and he appears to be dead. The Bible doesn't say he was dead. This is, not a, this is not a resurrection. But nonetheless, it's miraculous. Because look what happens next. This is one of those moments I almost hate to read this and just move on. Because it's like, wait, hold up. What did you just say? They dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him... He rose up, entered the city on the next day. He went on with Barnabas to Derby. It's like, say what? What just happened there? That's one of those stories you have to ask the Apostle Paul. It's an amazing thing. And when the passage says they gathered around him, is that implying possibly, probably, likely that they prayed for him? But the mission didn't stop. I just want you to get this picture in the story, though there are many others you could draw. The man was just stoned for telling the truth. And he got up. He didn't stop. And I made a note to myself, what would it take to stop me? What would it take to stop me? And in parentheses, truthfully, a lot less than that. That's it, God. I'm done. I've given enough. Because I would work through this mental equation. There aren't many people that have given what I've given. I mean, how many people have been stoned for their faith? There aren't many people who have done what, what I've done. I would also work to this equation, God, why would you let this happen to me? Are we not all susceptible to that to a degree? And for some, that is absolutely devastating to faith. God, I'm doing what you want me to do. I think I'm where you want me to be. I, I'm, I'm trying to be who I'm supposed to be. And then this happens? Why would you allow this? And I guess... For whatever it's worth, for any of us who go through unexpected pain, and this is not the sort that we invite upon ourselves. I'm not talking about hardship and difficulty, maybe 
as a result of foolish decisions or sinful actions. But when this kind of pain comes, how do you reconcile that? And I just know for myself, if God would allow it to happen to one of his chiefest servants, perhaps his chiefest servant in the New Testament era, then why would I be exempt from that? But I want to hit that theology of that just a bit more in just a second. Before I do, let me say this. Being faithful to King Jesus will be costly to all and fatal to some. Being faithful to King Jesus will be costly to all and fatal to some. We spoke to CV about the current religious culture in India. Roughly, each state operates somewhat autonomously when it comes to religious pressures, but the ruling government now is staunch Hindi government. They want India to be a Hindu nation. Uh, proselytizing is now illegal there. Um, evangelizing, making converts of other religions is a crime. Um, it's harder and harder to have gospel access and entrance into the city. And yet the church continues to grow. And missionaries continue to be sent. And people continue to be faithful. To what cost? We don't know. It'll be fatal to some, but it'll be costly to all. The Bible tells us that all who choose to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. When it comes to Paul's sufferings, though, we know these were promised. They're not unexpected. They're not out of the blue. In fact, if you look back at Romans chapter 9, if you were here during that message that Zach gave, you may remember this. Ananias wanted nothing to do with Paul. God had told Ananias, go lay hands on him, pray for him, endorse him. And Ananias, uh, reminding God of some things he thought maybe God had forgotten, of what Paul had done to other Christians like him, didn't want to. And one of the things that Paul told Ananias in, in Acts chapter 9, verse 16, was this, I'll show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. This was part of the plan. You see, for Paul, when those sufferings came, they weren't faith-destroying. They didn't wreck his faith. Miraculously, he continued to go. And sometimes push even harder. His sufferings were not faith destroying, but they were Jesus displaying. They were God honoring. And they were glory bringing. And Paul suffered as he did, allowed clearly by the hand of God. They were Jesus displaying, God honoring, and glory bringing sufferings. I'll give you an example. Paul wrote about this in much greater detail in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You can look this passage up, but let me read a portion of it. Here's what Paul said about suffering. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Do you see Paul's philosophy in that? Those two words, so powerful, but not. It's hard to understand, but I don't despair. It's painful, but I'm not crushed. Persecuted, but God has not abandoned me. Struck down, yet we endure. And listen to this personal theological statement of suffering. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. He says, I carry about in my body suffering because of Jesus. Why? God allowed that so that I could represent Jesus. I could display Jesus. For we are always, we live as those who are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. In these sufferings, I will make Jesus known. In these sufferings, I'm able to identify with the sufferings of Christ. In these sufferings, I'm able to display what a Christian is. So death is at work in us, he says in verse 12, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believe and so I spoke. We believe and so we speak. What did he believe? Verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 4. 
knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also, with Jesus, raise us and bring us into his, into his presence. What did he know? What kept him going? Jesus suffered and he died, but God raised him. And I know and believe this, God who raised Jesus will also raise me. And so I endure. What's the worst? I guess if Paul were summarizing for us, he would say, what's the worst that could happen to me? They kill me. But if they do, I'll be raised. I'll be raised with Jesus. And I'll so forever be with him in his presence. Verse 16, so we don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Is it possible that God can be doing something great and life-giving in the inner you, even as the outer you suffers? Absolutely. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What if God is preparing me and you to value him more than now in this world? To evaluate life there more than life here? To value, to value that kingdom more than this one? What if God's doing a work in us? It's amazing to me that Paul could say light and momentary affliction beyond all glory when he lists some of his persecutions. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, this time you just heard about. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from all these things, there's a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who's weak and I'm not weak? Who's made to, to fall and I am not indignant? And yet he said, light and momentary. You see, for the privilege of suffering for Jesus, Paul wasn't resentful. He was grateful. He wasn't resentful. He didn't become angry with God. He didn't blame God. He didn't turn against God. He says, God, for whatever reason, you have marked me worthy of suffering. May I display Christ in all my suffering. And so I guess a question for you to work through, and if you don't have an answer, this is certainly a spiritual life goal. What is your theology of suffering? And the reason I ask you that question is I don't think many Christians have one. And if they do have one, it's a bad one. That suffering and pain and hardship is foreign, should be foreign to my life as a follower of Christ. I mean, I've read the, I've read the tweets. I, I, I've read what all the popular TV preachers write and say. I should be succeeding, thriving, enjoying, being blessed, overcoming. Where does suffering fit? What's your theology of suffering and what will you do when it comes? Now, I want to point you very quickly to two incredible outcomes of this suffering. To me, they're kind of mind-blowing, mind honestly. We see what just happened to Paul. He'd been pushed out of one city for the fear of stoning, only to move to another city where he is stoned, drug out of the city, left for dead. Look at verse 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. There's two powerful outcomes. One, they returned. What are you going to do with that? They returned. They didn't quit. Again, back to that question, what would it take to stop me? A whole lot less, I think. Losing some Facebook friends, some pushback on my Twitter feed. Some uncomfortable conversations with the family around the dinner table. He returned. He went back. And as he returned, he strengthened the others. That was not so hard to, to fathom, is it? I mean, after what he'd been through and endured, can you imagine what he could do? You talk about the power of a testimony, of God getting you through, of God taking care of you, of God's sovereignty. And he strengthened them. How did he strengthen them? Again, look back at the text. Strengthen them. It, it tells them exactly how. He strengthened them by encouraging them to continue. Guys, don't quit. I'm going to encourage you, don't quit. And that strengthened them. 
by teaching them. It says he said that. And he teaches them theology. He encourages them personally. He teaches them theologically. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. This is not an easy path. This is a path paved with difficulty and hardship. So he, he encourages them emotionally, teaches them theologically, and then he protects them. He protects them spiritually. He appoints elders for them. Listen, I'm going to give now for you shepherds. I'm going to appoint shepherds for you to lead you, encourage you, help you. And he prayed and fasted for them. As he committed them to God, he prayed and fasted for them. That's how they were strengthened. Strengthened through encouragement, strengthened through solid teaching, strengthened through solid leadership, strengthened through prayer and fasting. Look at the result. Talked at the beginning just very briefly. And I didn't spend too much time giving cultural commentary because I don't think it's necessary. I think we get it. Can the church, here's the question, can the church, a church, any church, that holds the line on the truth, full of Christians who are not afraid of speaking the truth and living it out, who won't embrace the lies of our times, but instead will speak the truth of God. Can a church like that, in times like ours, make it? These are the kind of conversations I have sometimes with people in the community, other pastors sometimes. You can't do church like that now. People don't want that. They won't receive that. Can a church like that make it? Well, let's look at the example of Scripture. Verse 24. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Five things in that text. Just jump off the page. Prevailing church in a pagan culture. A church that stands on truth in an age of denial. God is glorified. We glorify God. We commend God. We say God for us is not just for our comfort and convenience. He is not for us our genie in the bottle, giving us the things that we think we want or need. God for us is our steadfast truth and reality. And we will not deviate. We will not stray. We will remain faithful. God is glorified. Not only that, the task is accomplished. The work they had fulfilled. What was that work? In the face of persecution, regardless of opposition, even from the very beginning of the text it says this, they were persecuted. It says a great number stirred up against them, poisoned their minds. What was their result? As people were stirred up against them, had animosity towards what they said, what was their reaction? So they stayed a while. They stayed a while. Completed the task. It's not by accident that you and I are Christians right now. It's not by accident that we're part of the church of the living God right now. Right now, in this time and place, in this culture. That has to mean something to us. It has to mean something to us that God counted us worthy of the calling and the task of the Great Commission for right now. You and I, we don't shrink back from that moment. We embrace that moment. God, for whatever reasons, you wanted us to be alive right now with what this world, what this nation, what this community is going through and what they need. That's us. We have a task. In this, the church is established. They gathered the church together. A church is birthed. We know it's a church. Elders now, there's leadership in place. There's structure and stability. A church has been established. A door is open to the Gentiles. The lost are being reached. These pagans who have never heard the gospel, the name of Jesus is going out. We saw in the text earlier that now the word of God is spread. It won't be long until we'll see in the book of Acts that you will not find anyone in this region who's not heard about him. And they remain no little time with the disciples. And I would add by implication, not adding to the text, but what that means is not only with those true believers, with the disciples, but making disciples. And this is everything you could hope for. I mean, you, you want a game plan? You want a playbook? For a church in difficult times, 
glorifying God, accomplishing the task that God has assigned, establishing the church, reaching the lost, making disciples. And they did that. And it wasn't easy. But that's the way God designed it. And that's what you're here for. It's not a sermon appreciation society. It's not a fellowship of the politically like-minded. It's an outpost of the kingdom of God in a world that desperately needs the invasion of Christ. And you and I are his ambassadors, God making his appeal through us. I implore you, be reconciled to God. I'm going to ask you if you pray with me this morning. Father, may we collectively, in unity, unity of, of purpose, unity of conviction, unity of love for one another and love for you and love for those whom you love and have called us to reach and unity of your spirit. Lock arms as one man for the gospel. May that be what we look like as a people. We've locked arms and when the enemy tries to break through our lines, When the enemy tries to discourage those on our perimeter, those at the edges, when the enemy brings a full frontal attack against the very truth we believe, or even the notion of truth, may we not let go. May we contend. And Father, individually, may we not shrink back. May we not shrink back. Not now. Times are too critical. The need is too great. The opportunity is too vast. But God, even as I say these things and pray these things, I know there are parts of our our human nature that go against these things. We want so much to not have conflicts. We want so much to be liked by everyone, to be well-received. We want so much to have ease and comfort. God, you've called us to something here that is a glorious calling. We're your ambassadors. I mean, that's just it. It's not just Paul and Barnabas. It's not just others named and unnamed we see in Scripture. It's it's us. That that statement, you're ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through you, that's me, that's us. That's, That's every disciple in this room. So God, make your appeal through faithful believers who are bold, who are well-studied and well-read in the truth, who know it and can share it, who are compassionate for the lostness of others, who are not willing to let people go down in their deception but out of love, offer the truth because we know the truth. The truth that sets sets men and women free. The truth that, as Paul said, you can't be ashamed of because it's the power of God unto salvation. But Lord, I pray even now, in these days to come, we would know the truth, speak the truth, live the truth, Father, you deliver people by the truth. So protect us, bless us, empower us, prepare us, strengthen us. And Lord, as Paul did, and these words do, that you inspired the writing of, may they be true of us. May we be encouraged in our spirits. May we be taught well with our minds, in our minds. May we be prepared well and strengthened by those who've been entrusted our care. Fathers, we pray, as we fast, show us your will, lead us rightly, and make us ready. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name.